Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Olivier Feno from Leti, and I will share the next session, section number uh, six, dedicated to uh, tunnel-fed devices. And the first uh, paper uh, will be given by uh, Tig Xiao from uh, UC Berkeley. And this is a joint work between uh, Berkeley, uh, MIT, and Sandia National Lab. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Patrick Xiao. And I'm a first year student uh, working with uh, Eli Yovanovitch at UC Berkeley. And today I'm going to talk about what we think is the biggest challenging facing uh, tunnel transistors. And since I'm the first to uh, talk about TFETs, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why, uh, what motivates us to study them. Uh, so in an ordinary transistor, the gate applied voltage modulates the uh, height of this energy barrier. And the current is given by, whoops, and the current is given by the uh, number of electrons that are thermally excited over that barrier, which gives us the thermal slope of 60 millivolts per decade. And if we combine that with the required uh, six or so decades of current needed to turn off the device, that gives us a minimum operating voltage of about 0.3, actually closer to 0.4 volts. And uh, today, the actual voltage is probably more like one volt. But there's no fundamental reason why we can't operate with a much lower voltage, saving orders of magnitude and power uh, if we can find a more sensitive switch. But uh, sensitivity is not enough. Uh, we also need, as I said before, a, a very high on-off ratio of about 10 to the 6. And the third requirement is that in order to drive the uh, transmission lines in our integrated circuits uh, and keep the RC time of our uh, signals uh, low enough, we also need a certain uh, 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 on-state conductance. Uh, good value would be a 1 millisiemen per micron of the device. Uh, so the TFET concept allows us, in principle, to do this uh, very well, uh, giving us very sharp switching, good on off ratio. And here's the concept. Uh, so here I've drawn the valence band and a conduction band of a semiconductor overlapping. And uh, these black bars are the ground state energies in these two bands. And here they overlap just right so that uh, uh, current flows. But as you change the voltage by just a little bit, the, uh, those levels no longer overlap and tunneling is forbidden so that uh, in the ideal case, there's no current at all. But as we all know, there's a host of problems that kind of make this uh, not really uh, realistic. And the one we want to focus on is that there is a whole bunch of states where they should not be inside the band gap. And uh, what can happen is that uh, carriers can tunnel from the valence band to these states, these trap states inside the band gap, and then be thermally excited to the conduction band. And this thermal excitation follows the thermal slope which of the ordinary transistor, which is uh, what we've been trying to escape from. And the biggest problem is that the, uh, if we use a quantum well, the density of states in the conduction band is only about 10 to the 12 states per uh, centimeter squared EV. And the typical uh, interface defect density inside the band gap is about 10 to the 11 or so. Uh, so that only gives us a on-off ratio of a factor of 10 uh, whereas we need 10 to the 6, and the rest of that on-off ratio, on ratio would be given by the thermal slope, which is uh, not very good. Uh, so we think this is a problem that plagues the whole field of TFETs, but for uh, this presentation, I'll single out this device from uh, Professor DeLalamo's group at MIT um, as kind of an example and show that we don't really need a very complicated uh, analysis to sh show, the, show how severe the problem is. Uh, so this is a indium gallium arsenide nanowire. Um, and the relevant tunneling junction is right here between the P plus source and the, uh, this little bit of indium arsenide at the uh, channel side of the junction. And I'll also note that the channel is made up of undoped in gas, which tends to be kind of n-type. And uh, <coughs> it's important to note that we don't really need a very high concentration of electrons here to uh, give us the uh, on-state on conductance that we observe. So it's never really uh, series resistance limited. Um, and to observe the uh, intrinsic, as close as possible, the intrinsic steepness of the device, we look at the uh, diode characteristics of our uh, device. So there's a lot of information here. Um, and uh, what I'm showing, the, so the best way to interpret this is that each of these curves is a diode curve um, with forward bias in the negative direction. And uh, by changing the gate voltage, VGD, which is fixed, uh, held fixed for each curve, we can kind of change the uh, operational mode of the diode. So over here in this regime where the tunneling, be or the band-to-band -band tunneling uh, occurs in reverse bias, so that's band-to-band -band tunneling. If that turns on in forward bias, then it's, it's an Asaki diode. 
If that turns on in reverse bias, then it's a backward diode. Uh, so let's look at the case of Isaki diodes first. Um, what we notice is that uh, it's kind of the same behavior at 77K and 300K. Um, and uh, we have a saturated band-to-band -band tunneling current. And what's happening as it falls off is that the bands are becoming misaligned. But the, tr but the carriers can still conduct to the other side by falling into these traps and then tunneling across. And this requires no thermal energy. So it's as we expect. It's uh, temperature independent. Uh, but there's a very significant difference between 77K and 300K if we look at the backward diode. Um, of course, in the on state, it's band to band tunneling, but uh, uh, the subthreshold slope is dominated by what appears to be the Boltzmann factor because it's so temperature dependent. And to simplify our comparison between the response at these two temperatures, uh, I've chosen two curves from the, from the uh, previous slide um, at these two temperatures. And I've chosen the gate voltages so that they have the same on state conductance, which is indicative of the same degree of band overlap in the on state. And uh, so in the subthreshold region where there's the biggest difference, we claim that uh, what's happening is, uh, what we're seeing is thermal activation. Uh, so to look a little bit more in detail at the uh, band diagram, um, we have uh, carriers that are tunneling from the valence band, or more specifically, the Fermi level on the P side, um, to uh, interface defects inside the band gap. And then they need to be excited over this energy barrier delta E to the conduction band of indium arsenide. And then they can uh, diffuse the rest of the way to the uh, M plus side. And so the critical parameter that uh, we should be interested in uh, as we study this thermal process is uh, this delta E. So uh, that's the difference between the conduction band and the uh, Fermi level. And the current, or the conductance, would then be given by this rate of excitation, which is the Boltzmann factor. Um, and as we change VDS, we expect to move this conduction band up and down. and um, we, uh, we should expect to observe a change in this uh, delta E. So if we take our conductance curves and uh, construct a series of Renius plots at these different drain source voltages, then we can extract an activation energy out and plot it as a function of the applied voltage. Uh, and this is what I've done. Uh, so at the top here, it kind of flattens out because the, uh, the low temperature curve hits a current floor. But once uh, <clears throat> Once you get here, you see that there's kind of a linear dependence of the, drain or of the activation energy on the drain source voltage, which is what we expect. Um, as you, uh, starting from here, as you increase the drain source voltage, we expect, the, uh, we expect the bands here to move down and the delta E activation energy to decrease. And here we've kind of reached the end of the linear region of the curve. And uh, the slope of this linear region we're seeing is roughly the um, efficiency that we're, uh, with which we can control the channel potential. Uh, from here on out, uh, it kind of stops following this linear dependence, uh, which just means that the device is no longer dominated by thermal activation. But, we can the, but the energy barrier still should follow this line. And here, delta equals 0, which is the onset of band-to-band -band tunneling. Uh, so from the physics that I've shown on the previous slides, I'll try to reconstruct what the uh, conductance curve should look like. And uh, in this case, I'm just showing the trap-assisted tunneling component. And uh, we can think of this, as I said before, as two uh, resistors that uh, either of which could be the rate-limiting step. At low voltage is thermal activation. And at uh, higher voltages, it's just tunneling. And here I've just drawn the tunneling current from traps as, uh, as just a flat line because it's kind of it's not meant to be a detailed model or simulation. Um, uh, as I said, we don't really need that. And then we add the band-to-band uh, -band tunneling current in parallel. Uh, so since we're not tunneling from quantum well to quantum well, we expect the band-to-band -band tunneling, once it turns on at the extracted voltage, to follow some kind of parallel with voltage. And then the measurements kind of uh, follow very closely the thermal slope down here, corrected by the electrostatic efficiency that we found. And then uh, since we know it's not series of listens limited, um, we have band-to-band uh, -band tunneling up here. Uh, but what else can we learn? So right here is where we found the device to be no longer uh, thermal activation limited. So on the left, the conductance should follow this kind of expression, where it's density of states time the, times the Boltzmann factor, um, with the brackets meaning that it's averaged over some energies selected by the Fermi levels. And over here, uh, through to the end of the curve, whether it's it's dominated by tunneling, whether it's to traps or between bands. 
And so from this information, we can very roughly estimate what the density of states ratio of, our, uh, of this device is. So since it follows the Boltzmann factor, since the conductance follows the Boltzmann factor so closely down here, uh, we can say that roughly the density of states of traps down in this region is fairly uniform, and that's the mid-gap. And from here on out where we say it's tunneling dominated, um, the density of states should follow this product. And if we say that the tunneling probability doesn't change, then this ratio of the conductance here to here should just be the ratio of the density of states. And we observed that to be about 100 or so. Uh, of course, in reality, uh, the tunneling probability doesn't change much, but it should increase as we have band overlap. And so, in fact, the density of states ratio between the band and the band gap would be even less than the factor of 10 to the 2 uh, from the previous slide. So this is kind of a rough estimate, but uh, we see that it's way uh, off from what we need, which is 10 to the 6, orders of magnitude off. And it's a materials problem. Uh, and just in case you were curious, um, there's uh, this tunneling assisted generation process is kind of observed in all kinds of TFETs, not just ours. Here's a couple of examples, which I won't go into. Uh, but in summary, um, uh, <clears throat> we think that the biggest problem facing TFETs is not just controlling the steepness, but getting the right on-off ratio. Um, and, the, uh, and what's preventing us from doing that right now is that there's a whole bunch of uh, interface defect states inside the band gap, um, which is only about a factor of 10 or 100 uh, smaller than the density of states uh, in the conduction band. And that severely limits how well we can turn off our device. And uh, <coughs> since we're so far off from this 10 to the 6 on-off ratio, uh, it seems to us that um, in order to fix this problem, we'll need to uh, dramatically suppress these interface defects and possibly move to new material systems uh, to accomplish that goal. And uh, I'll just wrap up here. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, I just got the mic. Um, I saw a poster uh, yesterday evening from the MIT Fitzgerald group on MOCVD, indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, where they showed some, what, what I was told was unique non-thermal behavior in the conductance. I'm not sure how it relates exactly to what you're talking about. Maybe the student who was telling me about it could get into a dialogue, but do you know about that work? Yeah, yeah, I know about that. So uh, what they were seeing in that, uh, in that uh, device, uh, they have non-thermal behavior, but the current only changed by a uh, couple orders of magnitude in that range. So we're basically never really entering the regime where the thermal activation becomes a limiting step. And in fact, for those uh, diodes, uh, there was never a point where the current was close to zero or the conductance was close to zero, which means that they were actually Asaki diodes. Uh, they were not backward diodes. And so with an Asaki diode, you don't necessarily see uh, thermal activated uh, temperature dependence. Yeah, so the, uh, the Fitzgerald work was uh, very interesting. Uh, but it kind of shows uh, what happens when the uh, uh, material structure is a little bit better. It was uh, simply a diode. There was no gate. And so you didn't have to fight the interface uh, uh, state density associated with uh, gate oxides. And so I think what the Fitzgerald group shows is that, yeah, if you have no gate, uh, you'll, a lot of your problems go away. But then, of course, if you have no gate, then uh, you don't have control either. Uh, so that's what I get out of uh, the Fitzgerald work. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's, I, I like the way that you're trying to do the back of the envelope. But I would recommend doing the same thing with uh, adding the actually analytical models. Because I think you're missing the SRH, uh, which is pure thermal. Um, which is a big problem too, but it's important to get the crossover from pure thermal leakages to the tunneling and trapezoid tunneling is in between. Uh, make sure identify that what is SRH limit, which is if, you, if the device is thin enough, it's going to go away. So my recommendation is to do full understanding of the model. Uh, yeah. First approach, I, I think it's good, but maybe improve one more level. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Can I question uh, you about that? So uh, you're saying that SRH, which is basically the effect of the defects, goes away if the uh, channel is thin? The, the bulk ones go away. 
the interface will never go away, obviously. Right. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have to move on to the next uh, paper, and uh, I would suggest to use the, uh, the coffee break to move uh, into those uh, very interesting discussions.